Chapter 47 Conservation Biology and Biodiversity Figure 47.1 Lake Victoria in Africa, shown in this satellite image, was the site of one of the most extraordinary evolutionary findings on the planet, as well as a casualty of devastating biodiversity loss. Credit. Modification of work by Rishav Tataraju, using NASA World Wind Software, introduction in the 1980s, Biologists working in Lake Victoria in Africa discovered one of the most extraordinary products of evolution on the planet. Located in the Great Rift Valley, Lake Victoria is an enormous and deep lake about 68,900 square kilometers in area, larger than Lake Huron, the second largest of North America's Great Lakes. Biologists were studying species of a family of fish called cichlids. When they sampled for fish in different locations of the lake, the researchers identified over 500 evolved species in total. However, the scientists soon discovered that the invasive Nile perch was destroying the lake's cichlid population, bringing hundreds of cichlid species to extinction with devastating rapidity. Chapter Outline 47.1 The Biodiversity Crisis 47.2 The Importance of Biodiversity to Human Life 47.3 Threats to Biodiversity 47.4 Preserving Biodiversity 47.1 The Biodiversity Crisis By the end of this section, you will be able to do the following. Define biodiversity in terms of species diversity and abundance. Describe biodiversity as the equilibrium of naturally fluctuating rates of extinction and speciation. Identify historical causes of high extinction rates in Earth's history Traditionally, ecologists have measured biodiversity, a general term for the number of species present in the biosphere, by taking into account both the number of species and their relative abundance to each other. Biodiversity can be estimated at a number of levels of organization of living organisms. These estimation indices, which came from information theory, are most useful as a first step in quantifying biodiversity between and within ecosystems. They are less useful when the main concern among conservation biologists is simply the loss of biodiversity. However, biologists recognize that measures of biodiversity, in terms of species diversity, may help focus efforts to preserve the biologically or technologically important elements of biodiversity. The Lake Victoria cichlids provide an example with which we can begin to understand biodiversity. The biologists studying cichlids in the 1980s discovered hundreds of cichlid species representing a variety of specializations to specialized habitat types and specific feeding strategies, such as eating plankton floating in the water, scraping, eating algae from rocks, eating insect larvae from the lake bottom, and eating the eggs of other species of cichlid. The cichlids of Lake Victoria are the product of an complex adaptive radiation. An adaptive radiation is a rapid, less than 3 million years in the case of the lake. Victoria cichlids. Branching through speciation of a phylogenetic clade into many closely related species. Typically, the species radiate into different habitats and niches. The Galapagos Island finches are an example of a modest adaptive radiation with 15 species. The cichlids of Lake Victoria are an example of a spectacular adaptive radiation that formerly included about 500 species. At the time biologists were making this discovery, some species began to quickly disappear. A culprit in these declines was the Nile perch, a species of large predatory fish that was introduced to Lake Victoria by fisheries to feed the people living around the lake. The Nile perch was introduced in 1963 but its populations did not begin to surge until the 1980s. The perch population grew by consuming cichlids, driving species after species to the point of extinction, the disappearance of a species. In fact, there were several factors that played a role in the extinction of perhaps 200 cichlid species in Lake Victoria. The Nile perch, declining lake water quality due to agriculture and land clearing on the shores of Lake Victoria, and increased fishing pressure. Scientists had not even catalogued all of the species present, so many were lost that were never named. The diversity is now a shadow of what it once was. The cichlids of Lake Victoria are a thumbnail sketch of contemporary rapid species loss that occurs all over Earth that is caused primarily by human activity. Extinction is a natural process of macroevolution that occurs at the rate of about 1 out of 1 million species becoming extinct per year. The fossil record reveals that there have been five periods of mass extinction in history with much higher rates of species loss, and the rate of species loss today is comparable to those periods of mass extinction. 
However, there is a major difference between the previous mass extinctions and the current extinction we are experiencing, human activity. Specifically, three human activities have a major impact. 1. Destruction of habitat. 2. Introduction of exotic species. And 3. Overharvesting. Predictions of species loss within the next century, a tiny amount of time on geological timescales, range from 10% to 50%. Extinctions on this scale have only happened five other times in the history of the planet, and these extinctions were caused by cataclysmic events that changed the course of the history of life in each instance. Types of biodiversity scientists generally accept that the term biodiversity describes the number and kinds of species and their abundance in a given location or on the planet. Species can be difficult to define. But most biologists still feel comfortable with the concept and are able to identify and count eukaryotic species in most contexts. Biologists have also identified alternate measures of biodiversity, some of which are important for planning 1372 Chapter 47, Conservation Biology and Biodiversity Access for Free at OpenStax.org. How to Preserve Biodiversity Genetic diversity is one of those alternate concepts. Genetic diversity, or genetic variation defines the raw material for evolution and adaptation in a species. A species' future potential for adaptation depends on the genetic diversity held in the genomes of the individuals and populations that make up the species. The same is true for higher taxonomic categories. A genus with very different types of species will have more genetic diversity than a genus with species that are genetically similar and have similar ecologies. If there were a choice between one of these genera of species being preserved, the one with the greatest potential for subsequent evolution is the most genetically diverse one. Many genes code for proteins, which in turn carry out the metabolic processes that keep organisms alive and reproducing. Genetic diversity can be measured as chemical diversity in that different species produce a variety of chemicals in their cells, both the proteins as well as the products and byproducts of metabolism. This chemical diversity has potential benefit for humans as a source of pharmaceuticals, so it provides one way to measure diversity that is important to human health and welfare. Humans have generated diversity in domestic animals, plants, and fungi, among many other organisms. This diversity is also suffering losses because of migration, market forces, and increasing globalism in agriculture, especially in densely populated regions such as China, India, and Japan. The human population directly depends on this diversity as a stable food source, and its decline is troubling biologists and agricultural scientists. It is also useful to define ecosystem diversity, meaning the number of different ecosystems on the planet or within a given geographic area, figure 47.2. Whole ecosystems can disappear even if some of the species might survive by adapting to other ecosystems. The loss of an ecosystem means the loss of interactions between species, the loss of unique features of co-adaptation, and the loss of biological productivity that an ecosystem is able to create. An example of a largely extinct ecosystem in North America is the prairie ecosystem. Prairies once spanned central North America from the boreal forest in northern Canada down into Mexico. They are now all but gone, replaced by crop fields, pasture lands, and suburban sprawl. Many of the species survive elsewhere, but the hugely productive ecosystem that was responsible for creating the most productive agricultural soils in the United States is now gone. As a consequence, native soils are disappearing or must be maintained and enhanced at great expense. 47.1. The Biodiversity Crisis 1373 Figure 47.2 The variety of ecosystems on Earth, from a coral reef to b prairie enables a great diversity of species to exist. Credit a modification of work by Jim Maragos. USFWS. Credit B. Modification of work by Jim Minarath. USFWS. Current species diversity despite considerable effort. Knowledge of the species that inhabit the planet is limited and always will be because of a continuing lack of financial resources and political willpower. A recent estimate suggests that the eukaryote species for which science has names, about 1.5 million species, account for less than 20% of the total number of eukaryote species present on the planet, 8.7 million species, by one estimate. Estimates of numbers of prokaryotic species are largely guesses, but biologists agree that science has only begun to catalog their diversity. 
Even with what is known, there is no central repository of names or samples of the described species. Therefore, there is no way to be sure that the 1.5 million descriptions is an accurate accounting. It is a best guess based on the opinions of experts in different taxonomic groups. Given that Earth is losing species at an accelerating pace, science is very much in the place it was with the Lake Victoria cichlids, knowing little about what is being lost. Table 47.1 presents recent estimates of biodiversity in different groups. Estimates of the numbers of described and predicted species by taxonomic group Mora et al. 20,111 Chapman 2092 Groombridge and Jenkins 2023 Described Predicted Described Predicted Described Predicted Animalia 1,140,516,9,920,000 Table 47.11374 Chapter 47 Conservation Biology and Biodiversity Access for Free at OpenStax.org. Mora et al. 20,111 Chapman 20,092 Groombridge and Jenkins 20,023 Chromista 17,892 34,925,044 200,500 Fungi 44,368 616,320 98,998 1,500,000 1,500,000 Planty 224,244 314,600 310,000 129 390,000 800 270,000 320,000 Protozoa 16,236 72,828,871 1,080,000 prokaryotes, 10,307 1,010,175, Protozoa 1,438,769 102, 10,897,502, Table 47.1 There are various initiatives to catalog described species in accessible ways, and the Internet is facilitating that effort. Nevertheless, it has been pointed out that at the current rate of new species descriptions, which according to the State of Observed Species Report is 17,000 to 20,000 new species per year, it will take close to 500 years to finish describing life on this planet.4 over time. The task becomes both increasingly difficult and increasingly easier as extinction removes species from the planet. Naming and counting species may seem like an unimportant pursuit given the other needs of humanity but determining biodiversity it is not simply an accounting of species. Describing a species is a complex process through which biologists determine an organism's unique characteristics and whether or not that organism belongs to any other described species or genus. It allows biologists to find and recognize the species after the initial discovery, and allows them to follow up on questions about its biology. In addition, the unique characteristics of each species make it potentially valuable to humans or other species on which humans depend. Patterns of biodiversity Biodiversity is not evenly distributed on Earth. Lake Victoria contained almost 500 species of cichlids alone, ignoring the other fish families present in the lake. All of these species were found only in Lake Victoria. Therefore, the 500 species of cichlids were endemic. Endemic species are found in only one location. Endemics with highly restricted distributions are particularly vulnerable to extinction. Higher taxonomic levels, such as genera and families, can also be endemic. Lake Michigan contains about 79 species of fish, many of which are found in other lakes in North America. What accounts for the difference in fish diversity in these two lakes? Lake Victoria is an ancient tropical lake, while Lake Michigan is a recently formed temperate lake. Lake Michigan in its present form is only about 7,000 years old, while Lake Victoria in its present form is about 15,000 years old, although its basin is about 400,000 years in age. Biogeographers have suggested these two factors, latitude and age, are two of several hypotheses to explain biodiversity patterns on the planet. One Mora Camilo et al. How many species are there on Earth and in the ocean? PLOS Biology, 2011, DOI. 10.1371 slash journal.pbio.1001127. 2.1371 slash journal.pbio.1001127.
2. Arthur D. Chapman, Numbers of Living Species in Australia and the World, 2nd ed. Canberra, O. Australian Biological Resources Study, 2009 https colon slash slash www.environment.gov.au slash system slash files slash pages slash 2e3f4a1-f130-465b-9c7a-7937368080a067 slash files slash nlsa-2nd-complete.pdf slash http colon slash slash openstacks.org slash l slash aus underscore diversity 3 brian groombridge and martin d jenkins world atlas of biodiversity earth's living resources in the 21st century berkeley university of california press 2002 4 international institute for species exploration iise 2011 state of observed species sos tempe arizona IISE, 2011. Accessed May, 20, 2012. HTTP colon slash slash www.esf.edu slash species slash HTTP colon slash slash openstacks.org slash L slash observed underscore species closing parenthesis. 47.1. The Biodiversity Crisis 1375 Career Connection Biogeographer Biogeography is the study of the distribution of the world's species both in the past and in the present. The work of biogeographers is critical to understanding our physical environment, how the environment affects species, and how environmental changes impact the distribution of a species. It has also been critical to developing modern evolutionary theory. Biogeographers need to understand both biology and ecology. They also need to be well-versed in evolutionary studies, soil science, and climatology. There are three main fields of study under the heading of biogeography, ecological biogeography, historical biogeography, called paleobiogeography, and conservation biogeography. Ecological biogeography studies the current factors affecting the distribution of plants and animals. Historical biogeography, as the name implies, studies the past distribution of species. Conservation biogeography, on the other hand, is focused on the protection and restoration of species based upon known historical and current ecological information. Each of these fields considers both zoogeography and phytogeography, the past and present distribution of animals and plants. One of the oldest observed patterns in ecology is that species biodiversity in almost every taxonomic group increases as latitude declines. In other words, biodiversity increases closer to the equator, figure 47.3. Figure 47.3 This map illustrates the number of amphibian species across the globe and shows the trend toward higher biodiversity at lower latitudes. A similar pattern is observed for most taxonomic groups. The white areas indicate a lack of data in this particular study. It is not yet clear why biodiversity increases closer to the equator, but scientists have several hypotheses. One factor may be the greater age of the ecosystems in the tropics versus those in temperate regions. The temperate regions were largely devoid of life or were drastically reduced during the last glaciation. The idea is that greater age provides more time for speciation. Another possible explanation is the increased direct energy the tropics receive from the sun versus the decreased intensity of the solar energy that temperate and polar regions receive. Tropical ecosystem complexity may promote speciation by increasing the heterogeneity, or number of ecological niches, in the tropics relative to higher latitudes. The greater heterogeneity provides more opportunities for coevolution, specialization, and perhaps greater selection pressures leading to population differentiation. However, this hypothesis suffers from some circularity. Ecosystems with more species encourage speciation, but how did they get more species to begin with? The tropics have been perceived as being more stable than temperate regions, which have a pronounced climate and day length seasonality. The tropics have their own forms of seasonality, such as rainfall, but they are generally assumed to be more stable environments and this stability might promote speciation into highly specialized niches. 1376 Chapter 47, Conservation Biology and Biodiversity Access for Free at OpenStacks.org Regardless of the mechanisms, it is certainly true that all levels of biodiversity are greatest in the tropics. Additionally, the rate of endemism is highest, and there are more biodiversity, hotspots. 
However, this richness of diversity also means that knowledge of species is unfortunately very low, and there is a high potential for biodiversity loss. Conservation of biodiversity in 1988 British environmentalist Norman Myers developed a conservation concept to identify areas rich in species and at significant risk for species loss. Biodiversity hotspots. Biodiversity hotspots are geographical areas that contain high numbers of endemic species. The purpose of the concept was to identify important locations on the planet for conservation efforts, a kind of conservation triage. By protecting hotspots, governments are able to protect a larger number of species. The original criteria for a hotspot included the presence of 1,500 or more endemic plant species and 70% of the area disturbed by human activity. There are now 34 biodiversity hotspots, figure 47.4, containing large numbers of endemic species, which include half of Earth's endemic plants. Figure 47.4 Conservation International has identified 34 biodiversity hotspots, which cover only 2.3% of the Earth's surface but have endemic to them 42% of the terrestrial vertebrate species and 50% of the world's plants. Biodiversity change through geological time The number of species on the planet, or in any geographical area, is the result of an equilibrium of two evolutionary processes that are continuously ongoing, speciation and extinction. Both are natural, birth, and death, processes of macroevolution. When speciation rates begin to outstrip extinction rates, the number of species will increase. Likewise, the number of species will decrease when extinction rates begin to overtake speciation rates. Throughout Earth's history, these two processes have fluctuated, sometimes leading to dramatic changes in the number of species on Earth as reflected in the fossil record, figure 47.5. 47.1 the biodiversity crisis 1377 figure 47.5 percent extinction occurrences as reflected in the fossil record have fluctuated throughout earth's history sudden and dramatic losses of biodiversity called mass extinctions have occurred five times paleontologists have identified five strata in the fossil record that appear to show sudden and dramatic greater than half of all extant species disappearing from the fossil record losses in biodiversity these are called mass extinctions. There are many lesser, yet still dramatic, extinction events, but the five mass extinctions have attracted the most research. An argument can be made that the five mass extinctions are only the five most extreme events in a continuous series of large extinction events throughout the Phanerozoic, since 542 million years ago. In most cases, the hypothesized causes are still controversial. However, the most recent mass extinction event seems clear. The five mass extinctions The fossil record of the mass extinctions was the basis for defining periods of geological history, so they typically occur at the transition point between geological periods. The transition in fossils from one period to another reflects the dramatic loss of species and the gradual origin of new species. These transitions can be seen in the rock strata. Table 47.2 provides data on the five mass extinctions. Mass extinctions geological period mass extinction name time, millions of years ago, Ordovician Silurian end Ordovician OS 450 to 440 Late Devonian end Devonian 375 to 360 Permian Triassic end Permian 251 Triassic Jurassic end Triassic 205 Cretaceous Paleogene end Cretaceous KPG, KT. 65.5 Table 47.2 This table shows the names and dates for the five mass extinctions in Earth's history. The Ordovician Silurian extinction event is the first recorded mass extinction and the second largest. During this period, about 1378 Chapter 47, Conservation Biology and Biodiversity Access for free at OpenStax.org. 85% of marine species, few species lived outside the oceans, became extinct. The main hypothesis for its cause is a period of glaciation and then warming. The extinction event actually consists of two extinction events separated by about one million years. The first event was caused by cooling, and the second event was due to the subsequent warming. The climate changes affected temperatures and sea levels. Some researchers have suggested that a gamma ray burst, caused by a nearby supernova, was a possible cause of the Ordovician Silurian extinction. The gamma ray burst would have stripped away the Earth's protective ozone layer, allowing intense ultraviolet radiation from the Sun to reach the surface of the Earth, 
and may account for climate changes observed at the time. The hypothesis is very speculative, and extraterrestrial influences on Earth's history are an active line of research. Recovery of biodiversity after the mass extinction took from 5 to 20 million years, depending on the location. The late Devonian extinction may have occurred over a relatively long period of time. It appears to have mostly affected marine species and not so much the plants or animals inhabiting terrestrial habitats. The causes of this extinction are poorly understood. The end Permian extinction was the largest in the history of life. Indeed, an argument could be made that Earth became nearly devoid of life during this extinction event. Estimates are that 96% of all marine species and 70% of all terrestrial species were lost. It was at this time, for example, that the trilobites, a group that survived the Ordovician Silurian extinction, became extinct. The causes for this mass extinction are not clear, but the leading suspect is extended and widespread volcanic activity that led to a runaway global warming event. The oceans became largely anoxic, suffocating marine life. Terrestrial tetrapod diversity took 30 million years to recover after the end Permian extinction. The Permian extinction dramatically altered Earth's biodiversity makeup and the course of evolution. The causes of the Triassic-Jurassic extinction event are not clear, and researchers argue hypotheses including climate change, asteroid impact, and volcanic eruptions. The extinction event occurred just before the breakup of the supercontinent Pangaea. Although recent scholarship suggests that the extinctions may have occurred more gradually throughout the Triassic. The causes of the end Cretaceous extinction event are the ones that are best understood. It was during this extinction event about 65 million years ago that the majority of the dinosaurs, the dominant vertebrate group for millions of years, disappeared from the planet, with the exception of a theropod clade that gave rise to birds. The cause of this extinction is now understood to be the result of a cataclysmic impact of a large meteorite, or asteroid, off the coast of what is now the Yucatan Peninsula. This hypothesis, proposed first in 1980, was a radical explanation based on a sharp spike in the levels of iridium, which enters our atmosphere from meteors at a fairly constant rate but is otherwise absent on Earth's surface, in the rock stratum that marks the boundary between the Cretaceous and Paleogene periods, figure 47.6. This boundary marked the disappearance of the dinosaurs in fossils as well as many other taxa. The researchers who discovered the iridium spike interpreted it as a rapid influx of iridium from space to the atmosphere, in the form of a large asteroid, rather than a slowing in the deposition of sediments during that period. It was a radical explanation, but the report of an appropriately aged and sized impact crater in 1991 made the hypothesis more believable. Now an abundance of geological evidence supports the theory. Recovery times for biodiversity after the end Cretaceous extinction are shorter, in geological time, than for the end Permian extinction, on the order of 10 million years. Another possibility, perhaps coincidental with the impact of the Yucatan asteroid, was extensive volcanism that began forming about 66 million years ago, about the same time as the Yucatan asteroid impact, at the end of the Cretaceous. The lava flows covered over 50% of what is now India. The release of volcanic gases, particularly sulfur dioxide, during the formation of the traps contributed to climate change, which may have induced the mass extinction. 47.1. The Biodiversity Crisis 1379 Visual Connection Figure 47.6 in 1980, Luis and Walter Alvarez, Frank Asaro, and Helen Mickles discovered, across the world, a spike in the concentration of iridium within the sedimentary layer at the KPG boundary. These researchers hypothesized that this iridium spike was caused by an asteroid impact that resulted in the KPG mass extinction. In the photo, the iridium layer is the light band. Credit. USGS, scientists measured the relative abundance of fern spores above and below the KPG boundary in this rock sample. Which of the following statements most likely represents their findings? A. An abundance of fern spores from several species was found below the KPG boundary, but none was found above. b. An abundance of fern spores from several species was found above the KPG boundary, but none was found below. c. An abundance of fern spores was found both above and below the KPG boundary, but only one species was found below the boundary, and many species were found above the boundary. d. Many species of fern spores were found both above and below the boundary, 
but the total number of spores was greater below the boundary. Link to learning explore this interactive website, http colon slash slash openstacks.org slash l slash extinctions closing parenthesis about mass extinctions. The Pleistocene extinction The Pleistocene extinction is one of the lesser extinctions, and a recent one. It is well known that the North American, and to some degree Eurasian, megafauna, large vertebrate animals, disappeared toward the end of the last glaciation period. The extinction appears to have happened in a relatively restricted time period of 10,000 to 12,000 years ago. In North America, the losses were quite dramatic and included the woolly mammoths, with an extant population existing until about 4,000 years ago in isolation on Wrangell Island, Canada, Mastodon, giant beavers, giant ground sloths, saber-toothed cats, and the North American camel, just to name a few. In the early 1900s, scientists first suggested the possibility that overhunting caused the rapid extinction of these large animals. Research into this hypothesis continues today. In general, the timing of the Pleistocene extinctions correlated with the arrival of paleo-humans, perhaps as long as 40,000 years ago, and not with climate change events, which is the main competing hypothesis for these extinctions. The extinctions began in Australia about 40,000 to 50,000 years ago, just after the arrival of humans in the area. A marsupial lion, a giant wonton wombat, and several giant kangaroo species disappeared. In North America, the extinctions of almost all of the large mammals occurred 10,000 to 12,000 years ago. All that are left are the smaller mammals such as bears, elk, moose, and cougars. Finally, on many remote oceanic islands, the extinctions of many species occurred coincidentally with human arrivals. Not all of the islands had large animals, but when there were large animals, they were often forced into extinction. Madagascar was colonized about 2,000 years ago and the large mammals that lived there became extinct. Eurasia and Africa do not show this pattern, but they also did not experience a recent arrival of hunter-gatherer humans. Rather, humans arrived in Eurasia hundreds of thousands of years ago. This topic remains an area of active research and hypothesizing. It seems clear that even if climate played a role, in most cases human hunting precipitated the extinctions. 1380 Chapter 47, Conservation Biology and Biodiversity Access for free at OpenStacks.org. Recent extinctions The sixth, or Holocene, mass extinction appears to have begun earlier than previously believed and is largely due to the disruptive activities of modern Homo sapiens. Since the beginning of the Holocene period, there are numerous recent extinctions of individual species that are recorded in human writings. Most of these are coincident with the expansion of the European colonies since the 1500s. One of the earlier and popularly known examples is the dodo bird. The odd pigeon-like bird lived in the forests of Mauritius, an island in the Indian Ocean, and became extinct around 1662. The dodo was hunted for its meat by sailors and was easy prey because it approached people without fear. The dodo had not evolved with humans. Pigs, rats, and dogs brought to the island by European ships also killed dodo young and eggs. Stellar sea cow became extinct in 1768. It was related to the manatee and probably once lived along the northwest coast of North America. Stellar sea cow was first discovered by Europeans in 1741 and was overhunted for meat and oil. The last sea cow was killed in 1768. That amounts to just 27 years between the sea cow's first contact with Europeans and extinction of the species. Since 1900, a variety of species have gone extinct, including the following. In 1914, the last living passenger pigeon died in a zoo in Cincinnati, Ohio. This species had once darkened the skies of North America during its migrations, but it was overhunted and suffered from habitat loss that resulted from the clearing of forests for farmland. The Carolina parakeet, once common in the eastern United States, died out in 1918. It suffered habitat loss and was hunted to prevent it from eating orchard fruit. The parakeet ate orchard fruit because its native foods were destroyed to make way for farmland. The Japanese sea lion, which inhabited a broad area around Japan and the coast of Korea, became extinct in the 1950s due to fishermen. The Caribbean monk seal was distributed throughout the Caribbean Sea but was driven to extinction via hunting by 1952. These are only a few of the recorded extinctions in the past 500 years. The International Union for Conservation of Nature, IUCN, 
keeps a list of extinct and endangered species called the Red List. The list is not complete, but it describes 380 extinct species of vertebrates after 1500 AD, 86 of which were driven extinct by overhunting or overfishing. Estimates of present time extinction rates Estimates of extinction rates are hampered by the fact that most extinctions are probably happening without observation. The extinction of a bird or mammal is likely to be noticed by humans, especially if it has been hunted or used in some other way. But there are many organisms that are of less interest to humans, not necessarily of less value, and many that are undescribed. The background extinction rate is estimated to be about 1 per million species per year, e msy. For example, assuming there are about 10 million species in existence, the expectation is that 10 species would become extinct each year. Each year represents 10 million species per year. One contemporary extinction rate estimate uses the extinctions in the written record since the year 1500. For birds alone this method yields an estimate of 26 e msy. However, this value may be an underestimate for three reasons. First, many species would not have been described until much later in the time period, so their loss would have gone unnoticed. Second, the number of recently extinct vertebrate species is increasing because extinct species now are being described from skeletal remains. And third, some species are probably already extinct even though conservationists are reluctant to name them as such. Taking these factors into account raises the estimated extinction rate closer to 100 e msy. The predicted rate by the end of the century is 1500 e msy. A second approach to estimating present time extinction rates is to correlate species loss with habitat loss by measuring forest area loss and understanding species area relationships. The species area relationship is the rate at which new species are seen when the area surveyed is increased. Studies have shown that the number of species present increases as the size of the island increases. This phenomenon has also been shown to hold true in other island-like habitats as well, such as the mountaintop tepas of Venezuela, which are surrounded by tropical forest. Turning this relationship around, if the habitat area is reduced, the number of species living there will also decline. Estimates of extinction rates based on habitat loss and species area relationships have suggested that with about 90% habitat loss an expected 50% of species would become extinct. Species area estimates have led to species extinction rate calculations of about 1000 e msy and higher. In general, actual observations do not show this amount of loss and suggestions have been made that there is a delay in extinction. Recent work has also called into question the applicability of the species area relationship when estimating the loss of species. This work 47.1 the Biodiversity Crisis 1381 argues that the species area relationship leads to an overestimate of extinction rates. A better relationship to use may be the endemics area relationship. Using this method would bring estimates down to around 500 e msy in the coming century. Note that this value is still 500 times the background rate. Figure 47.7 studies have shown that the number of species present increases with the size of the habitat. Credit. Modification of work by Adam B. Smith. Link to learning check out this interactive exploration. http colon slash slash openstacks.org slash l slash what underscore is underscore missing closing parenthesis of endangered and extinct species, their ecosystems, and the causes of the endangerment or extinction. 47.2 The importance of biodiversity to human life by the end of this section. You will be able to do the following. Identify chemical diversity benefits to humans. Identify biodiversity components that support human agriculture. Describe ecosystem services. It may not be clear why biologists are concerned about biodiversity loss. When biodiversity loss is thought of as the extinction of the passenger pigeon, the dodo bird, and even the woolly mammoth, the loss may appear to be an emotional one. But is the loss practically important for the welfare of the human species? From the perspective of evolution and ecology, the loss of a particular individual species is unimportant. However, we should note that the loss of a keystone species can lead to ecological disaster. Extinction is a normal part of macroevolution. But the accelerated extinction rate translates into the loss of tens of thousands of species within our lifetimes, and it is likely to have dramatic effects on human welfare through the collapse of ecosystems and in added costs to maintain food production, clean air and water, and human health. 
Agriculture began after early hunter-gatherer societies first settled in one place and heavily modified their immediate environment. This cultural transition has made it difficult for humans to recognize their dependence on undomesticated living things on the planet. Biologists recognize the human species as embedded in ecosystems and as dependent on them, just as every other species on the planet is dependent. Technology smooths out the extremes of existence, but ultimately the human species cannot exist without a supportive ecosystem. Human health archaeological evidence indicates that humans have been using plants for medicinal uses for thousands of years. A Chinese document from approximately 2800 BC is believed to be the, the first written account of herbal remedies, and such references occur throughout the global historical record. Contemporary indigenous societies that live close to the land often retain broad knowledge of the medicinal uses of plants growing in their area. Most plants produce secondary plant compounds, which are toxins used to protect the plant from insects and other animals that eat them, but some of which also work as medication. Modern pharmaceutical science also recognizes the importance of these plant compounds. Examples of significant medicines 1382 Chapter 47 Conservation Biology and Biodiversity Access for free at OpenStax.org. Derived from plant compounds include aspirin, codeine, digoxin, atropine, and vincristine, figure 47.8. Many medicines were once derived from plant extracts but are now synthesized. It is estimated that, at one time, 25% of modern drugs contained at least one plant extract. That number has probably decreased to about 10% as natural plant ingredients are replaced by synthetic versions. Antibiotics, which are responsible for extraordinary improvements in health and lifespans in developed countries, are compounds largely derived from fungi and bacteria. Figure 47.8 Catharanthus roseus, the Madagascar periwinkle, has various medicinal properties. Among other uses, it is a source of vincristine, a drug used in the treatment of lymphomas. Credit. Forrest and Kim Starr, in recent years, animal venoms and poisons have excited intense research for their medicinal potential. By 2007, the FDA had approved five drugs based on animal toxins to treat diseases such as hypertension, chronic pain, and diabetes. Another five drugs are undergoing clinical trials, and at least six drugs are being used in other countries. Other toxins under investigation come from mammals, snakes, lizards, various amphibians, fish, snails, octopuses, and scorpions. Aside from representing billions of dollars in profits, these medicines improve people's lives. Pharmaceutical companies are always looking for new compounds synthesized by living organisms that can function as medicines. It is estimated that one-third of pharmaceutical research and development is spent on natural compounds and that about 35% of new drugs brought to market between 1981 and 2002 were derived from natural compounds. The opportunities for new medications will be reduced in direct proportion to the disappearance of species. Agricultural diversity Since the beginning of human agriculture more than 10,000 years ago, human groups have been breeding and selecting crop varieties. This crop diversity matched the cultural diversity of highly subdivided populations of humans. For example, potatoes were domesticated beginning around 7,000 years ago in the central Andes of Peru and Bolivia. The potatoes grown in that region belong to seven species and the number of varieties likely is in the thousands. Even the Inca capital of Machu Picchu had numerous gardens growing varieties of potatoes. Each variety has been bred to thrive at particular elevations and soil and climate conditions. The diversity is driven by the diverse demands of the topography, the limited movement of people, and the demands created by crop rotation for different varieties that will do well in different fields. Potatoes are only one example of human-generated diversity. Every plant, animal, and fungus that has been cultivated by humans has been bred from original wild ancestor species into diverse varieties arising from the demands for food value, adaptation to growing conditions, and resistance to pests. The potato also demonstrates risks of low crop diversity. The tragic Irish potato famine occurred when the single variety grown in Ireland became susceptible to a potato blight, wiping out the entire crop. The loss of the potato crop led to mass famine and the related deaths of over 1 million people, as well as mass emigration of nearly 2 million people. Disease resistance is a chief benefit of crop. Biodiversity and lack of diversity in contemporary crop species carries similar risks. 
seed companies, which are the source of most crop varieties in developed countries, must continually breed new varieties to keep up with evolving pest organisms. These same seed companies, however, have participated in the decline of the number of varieties available as they focus on selling fewer varieties in more areas of the world. The ability to create new crop varieties relies on the diversity of varieties available and the accessibility of wild forms related to 47.2, the importance of biodiversity to human life 1383 the crop plant. These wild forms are often the source of new gene variants that can be bred with existing varieties to create varieties with new attributes. Loss of wild species related to a crop will mean the loss of potential in crop improvement. Maintaining the genetic diversity of wild species related to domesticated species ensures our continued food supply. Since the 1920s, government agriculture departments have maintained seed banks of crop varieties as a way of maintaining crop diversity. This system has flaws because, over time, seed banks are lost through accidents, and there is no way to replace them. In 2008, the Svalbard Global Seed Vault, figure 47.9, began storing seeds from around the world as a backup system to the regional seed banks. If a regional seed bank stores varieties in Svalbard, losses can be replaced from Svalbard. Conditions within the vault are maintained at ideal temperature and humidity for seed survival, but the deep underground location of the vault in the Arctic means that failure of the vault systems will not compromise the climatic conditions inside the vault. Visual Connection Figure 47.9 The Svalbard Global Seed Vault is a storage facility for seeds of Earth's diverse crops. Credit. Mari Teffer, Svalbard Global Seed Vault. The Svalbard Global Seed Vault is located on Spitsbergen Island in Norway, which has an Arctic climate. Why might an Arctic climate be good for seed storage? Crop success is largely dependent on the quality of the soil. Although some agricultural soils are rendered sterile using controversial cultivation and chemical treatments, most contain a huge diversity of organisms that maintain nutrient cycles, breaking down organic matter into nutrient compounds that crops need for growth. These organisms also maintain soil texture that affects water and oxygen dynamics in the soil that are necessary for plant growth. If farmers had to maintain arable soil using alternate means, the cost of food would be much higher than it is now. These kinds of processes are called ecosystem services. They occur within ecosystems, such as soil ecosystems, as a result of the diverse metabolic activities of the organisms living there, but they provide benefits to human food production, drinking water availability, and breathable air. Plant pollination is another key. Ecosystem service, provided by various species of bees, other insects, and birds. One estimate indicates that honey bee pollination provides the United States a $1.6 billion annual benefit. Honey bee populations in North America have been suffering large losses caused by a syndrome known as colony collapse disorder, whose cause is unclear. Evidence suggests the possible culprits may be the invasive varroa mite coupled with the nosema gut parasite and acute paralysis virus. Loss of these species would render it very difficult, if not impossible to grow any of the 150 United States crops requiring pollination, including grapes, oranges, lemons, peppers, most brassica, broccoli and cauliflower, and many berries, melons, and nuts. Finally, humans compete for their food with crop pests, most of which are insects. Pesticides control these competitors, however, pesticides are costly and lose their effectiveness over time as pest populations adapt and evolve. They also lead to collateral damage by killing non-pest species and risking the health of consumers and agricultural workers. Ecologists believe that the bulk of the work in removing pests is actually done by predators and parasites of those pests, but the impact has not been well studied. A review found that in 74% of studies that looked for an effect of landscape complexity on Natural 1384 Chapter 47, Conservation Biology and Biodiversity Access for free at OpenStax.org. Enemies of pests, the greater the complexity, the greater the effect of pest-suppressing organisms. An experimental study found that introducing multiple enemies of P. aphids, an important alfalfa pest, increased the yield of alfalfa significantly. This study shows the importance of landscape diversity via the question of whether a diversity of pests is more effective at control than one single pest. The results showed this to be the case. Loss of diversity in pest enemies will inevitably make it more difficult and costly to grow food. 
Wild food sources in addition to growing crops and raising animals for food. Humans obtain food resources from wild populations, primarily fish populations. In fact, for approximately 1 billion people worldwide, aquatic resources provide the main source of animal protein. But since 1990, global fish production has declined, sometimes dramatically. Unfortunately, and despite considerable effort, few fisheries on the planet are managed for sustainability. Fishery extinctions rarely lead to complete extinction of the harvested species, but rather to a radical restructuring of the marine ecosystem in which a dominant species is so over-harvested that it becomes a minor player, ecologically. In addition to humans losing the food source, these alterations affect many other species in ways that are difficult or impossible to predict. The collapse of fisheries has dramatic and long-lasting effects on local populations that work in the fishery. In addition, the loss of an inexpensive protein source to populations that cannot afford to replace it will increase the cost of living and limit societies in other ways. In general, the fish taken from fisheries have shifted to smaller species as larger species are fished to extinction. The ultimate outcome could clearly be the loss of aquatic systems as food sources. Link to learning view a brief video, http colon slash slash openstacks.org slash l slash declining underscore fish closing parenthesis discussing declining fish stocks. Psychological and moral value Finally, it has been clearly shown that humans benefit psychologically from living in a biodiverse world. A chief proponent of this idea is Harvard entomologist E. O. Wilson. He argues that human evolutionary history has adapted us to live in a natural environment and that city environments generate psychological stressors that affect human health and well-being. There is considerable research into the psychological regenerative benefits of natural landscapes that suggests the hypothesis may hold some truth. In addition, there is a moral argument that humans have a responsibility to inflict as little harm as possible on other species. 47.3 Threats to Biodiversity By the end of this section, you will be able to do the following. Identify significant threats to biodiversity. Explain the effects of habitat loss, the introduction of exotic species, and hunting on biodiversity. Identify the early and predicted effects of climate change on biodiversity The core threat to biodiversity on the planet, and therefore a threat to human welfare, is the combination of human population growth and resource exploitation. The human population requires resources to survive and grow, and those resources are being removed unsustainably from the environment. The three greatest proximate threats to biodiversity are habitat loss, overharvesting, and the introduction of exotic species. The first two of these are a direct result of human population growth and resource use. The third results from increased mobility and trade. A fourth major cause of extinction, anthropogenic climate change, has not yet had a large impact but it is predicted to become significant during this century. Global climate change is also a consequence of human population needs for energy and the use of fossil fuels to meet those needs. Figure 47.10 Environmental issues, such as toxic pollution, have specific targeted effects on species, but they are not generally seen as threats at the magnitude of the others. 47.3 Threats to Biodiversity 1385 Figure 47.10 Atmospheric carbon dioxide levels fluctuate in a cyclical manner. However, the burning of fossil fuels in recent history has caused a dramatic increase in the levels of carbon dioxide in the Earth's atmosphere, which have now reached levels never before seen in human history. Scientists predict that the addition of this greenhouse gas to the atmosphere is resulting in climate change that will significantly impact biodiversity in the coming century. Habitat loss humans rely on technology to modify their environment and replace certain functions that were once performed by the natural ecosystem. Other species cannot do this. Elimination of their ecosystem. Whether it is a forest, a desert, a grassland, a freshwater estuarine, or a marine environment, will kill the individuals belonging to the species. The species will become extinct if we remove the entire habitat within the range of a species. Human destruction of habitats accelerated in the latter half of the 20th century. Consider the exceptional biodiversity of Sumatra. It is home to one species of orangutan, a species of critically endangered elephant, and the Sumatran tiger, but half of Sumatra's forest is now gone. The neighboring island of Borneo, home to the other species of orangutan, has lost a similar area of forest. 
Forest loss continues in protected areas of Borneo. All three species of orangutan are now listed as endangered by the International Union for Conservation of Nature, IUCN, but they are simply the most visible of thousands of species that will not survive the disappearance of the forests in Sumatra and Borneo. The forests are removed for timber and to plant palm oil plantations, figure 47.11. Palm oil is used in many products including food products, cosmetics, and biodiesel in Europe. A five-year estimate of global forest cover loss for the years 2000-2005 was 3.1%. In the humid tropics where forest loss is primarily from timber extraction, 272,000 square kilometers was lost out of a global total of 11,564,000 square kilometers, or 2.4%. In the tropics, these losses certainly also represent the extinction of species because of high levels of endemism, species unique to a defined geographic location, and found nowhere else. 1386 Chapter 47, Conservation Biology and Biodiversity Access for Free at OpenStax.org. Figure 47.11, a. Uh, one of three species of orangutan, Pongo pygmaeus, is found only in the rainforests of Borneo, and another species of orangutan, Pongo abeli, is found only in the rainforests of Sumatra. These animals are examples of the exceptional biodiversity of, c, the islands of Sumatra and Borneo. Other species include the, b, Sumatran tiger, Panthera tigris sumatrae, and the, d, Sumatran elephant, Elephus maximus sumatranus, both critically endangered species. Rainforest habitat is being removed to make way for, e, oil palm plantations such as this one in Borneo Saba province. Credit A. Modification of work by Thorsten Bachner. Credit B. Modification of work by Dick Muddy. Credit C. Modification of work by USCIA World Factbook. Credit D. Modification of work by Nonprofit Organizations, Flickr. Credit E. Modification of work by Dr. Lien Pin Co. Everyday connection preventing habitat destruction with wise wood choices Most consumers are not aware that the home improvement products they buy might be contributing to habitat loss and species extinctions. Yet the market for illegally harvested tropical timber is huge, and the wood products often find themselves in building supply stores in the United States. One estimate is that 10% of the imported timber stream in the United States, which is the world's largest consumer of wood products, is potentially illegally logged. In 2006, this amounted to $3.6 billion in wood products. Most of the illegal products are imported from countries that act as 47.3. Threats to biodiversity 1387 habitat destruction can affect ecosystems other than forests. Rivers and streams are important ecosystems that are frequently modified through land development, damming, channelizing, or water removal. Damming affects the water flow to all parts of a river which can reduce or eliminate populations that had adapted to the natural flow of the river. For example, an estimated 91% of United States rivers have been altered in some way. Modifications include dams, to create energy or store water, levees, to prevent flooding, and dredging or rerouting, to create land that is more suitable for human development. Many fish and amphibian species and numerous freshwater clams in the United States have seen declines caused by river damming and habitat loss. Overharvesting Overharvesting is a serious threat to many species, but particularly to aquatic, both marine and freshwater, species. Despite regulation and monitoring, there are recent examples of fishery collapse. The Western Atlantic cod fishery is the among the most significant. While it was a hugely productive fishery for 400 years, the introduction of modern factory trawlers in the 1980s caused it to become unsustainable. Fisheries collapse as a result of both economic and political factors. Fisheries are managed as a shared international resource even when the fishing territory lies within an individual country's territorial waters. Common resources are subject to an economic pressure known as the tragedy of the commons, in which essentially no fisher has a motivation to exercise restraint in harvesting a fishery when it is not owned by that fisher. Overexploitation is a common outcome. This overexploitation is exacerbated when access to the fishery is open and unregulated and when technology gives fishers the ability to overfish. In a few fisheries, the biological growth of the resource is less than the potential growth of the profits made from fishing if that time and money were invested elsewhere. In these cases, whales are an example. 
economic forces will always drive toward fishing the population to extinction. Link to learning explore a U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service interactive map http colon slash slash openstacks.org slash l slash habitat underscore map closing parenthesis of critical habitat for endangered and threatened species in the United States. To begin, select, visit the online mapper. For the most part, fishery extinction is not equivalent to biological extinction. The last fish of a species is rarely fished out of the ocean. At the same time, fishery extinction is still harmful to fish species and their ecosystems. There are some instances in which true extinction is a possibility. Whales have slow growing populations due to low reproductive rates, and therefore are at risk of complete extinction through hunting. There are some species of sharks with restricted distributions that are at risk of extinction. The groupers are another population of generally slow growing fishes that, in the Caribbean, includes a number of species that are at risk of extinction from overfishing. Coral reefs are extremely diverse marine ecosystems that face immediate peril from several processes. Reefs are home to one third of the world's marine fish species, about 4,000 species, despite making up only 1% of marine habitat. Most home marine aquaria are stocked with wild caught organisms, not cultured organisms. Although no species is known to have been driven extinct by the pet trade in marine species, there are studies showing that populations of some species have declined in response to harvesting, indicating that the harvest is not sustainable at those levels. There are concerns about the effect of the pet trade on some terrestrial species such as turtles, amphibians, birds, plants, and even the orangutan. Intermediaries and are not the originators of the wood. How is it possible to determine if a wood product, such as flooring, was harvested sustainably or even legally? The Forest Stewardship Council, FSC, certifies sustainably harvested forest products, therefore, looking for their certification on flooring and other hardwood products is one way to ensure that the wood has not been taken illegally from a tropical forest. Certification applies to specific products, not to a producer. Some producers' products may not have certification while other products are certified. While there are other industry-backed certifications other than the FSC, these are unreliable due to lack of independence from the industry. Another approach is to buy domestic wood species. While it would be great if there was a list of legal versus illegal wood products, it is not that simple. Logging and forest management laws vary from country to country. What is illegal in one country may be legal in another. Where and how a product is harvested and whether the forest from which it comes is being maintained sustainably all factor into whether a wood product will be certified by the FSC. If you are in doubt, it is always a good idea to ask questions about where a wood product came from and how the supplier knows that it was harvested legally. 1388 Chapter 47, Conservation Biology and Biodiversity Access for free at OpenStacks.org. Link to learning view a brief video, http colon slash slash openstacks.org slash l slash ocean underscore matters closing parenthesis discussing the role of marine ecosystems in supporting human welfare and the decline of ocean ecosystems. Bushmeat is the generic term used for wild animals killed for food. Hunting is practiced throughout the world, but hunting practices, particularly in equatorial Africa and parts of Asia, are believed to threaten a number of species with extinction. Traditionally, bushmeat in Africa was hunted to feed families directly. However, recent commercialization of the practice now has bushmeat available in grocery stores, which has increased harvest rates to the level of unsustainability. Additionally, human population growth has increased the need for protein foods that are not being met from agriculture. Species threatened by the bushmeat trade are mostly mammals including many primates living in the Congo Basin. Exotic species Exotic species are species that have been intentionally or unintentionally introduced into an ecosystem in which they did not evolve. For example, kudzu, Poraria labata, which is native to Japan, was introduced in the United States in 1876. It was later planted for soil conservation. Problematically, it grows too well in the southeastern United States, up to a foot a day. It is now an invasive pest species and covers over seven million acres in the southeastern United States. If an introduced species is able to survive in its new habitat, that introduction is now reflected in the observed range of the species. Human transportation of people and goods, including the intentional transport of organisms for trade, has dramatically increased the introduction of species into new ecosystems, 
sometimes at distances that are well beyond the capacity of the species to ever travel itself and outside the range of the species' natural predators. Most exotic species introductions probably fail because of the low number of individuals introduced or poor adaptation to the ecosystem they enter. Some species, however, possess pre-adaptations that can make them especially successful in a new ecosystem. These exotic species often undergo dramatic population increases in their new habitat and reset the ecological conditions in the new environment, threatening the species that exist there. For this reason, exotic species are also called invasive species. Exotic species can threaten other species through competition for resources, predation, or disease. For example, the Eurasian star thistle, also called spotted knapweed, has invaded and rendered useless some of the open prairies of the western states. However, it is a great nectar-bearing flower for the production of honey and supports numerous pollinating insects, including migrating monarch butterflies in the north-central states such as Michigan. Link to learning explore an interactive global database, http colon slash slash openstacks.org slash l slash exotic underscore invasive closing parenthesis of exotic or invasive species. Lakes and islands are particularly vulnerable to extinction threats from introduced species. In Lake Victoria, as mentioned earlier, the intentional introduction of the Nile perch was largely responsible for the extinction of about 200 species of endemic cichlids. The accidental introduction of the brown tree snake via aircraft, figure 47.12, from the Solomon Islands to Guam in 1950 has led to the extinction of three species of birds and three to five species of reptiles endemic to the island. Several other species are still threatened. The brown tree snake is adept at exploiting human transportation as a means to migrate. One was even found on an aircraft arriving in Corpus Christi, Texas. Constant vigilance on the part of airport, military, and commercial aircraft personnel is required to prevent the snake from moving from Guam to other islands in the Pacific, especially Hawaii. Islands do not make up a large area of land on the globe, but they do contain a disproportionate number of endemic species because of their isolation from mainland ancestors. 47.3. Threats to Biodiversity 1389 Figure 47.12 The brown tree snake, Boiga irregularis, is an exotic species that has caused numerous extinctions on the island of Guam since its accidental introduction in 1950. Credit. NPS, it now appears that the global decline in amphibian species recognized in the 1990s is, in some part, caused by the fungus Betrachochytrium dendrobatidus, which causes the disease Chytridiomycosis, figure 47.13. There is evidence that the fungus is native to Africa and may have been spread throughout the world by transport of a commonly used laboratory and pet species, the African clawed toad, Xenopus laevis. It may well be that biologists themselves are responsible for spreading this disease worldwide. The North American bullfrog, Rana catesbayana, which has also been widely introduced as a food animal but which easily escapes captivity, survives most infections of Betrachochytrium dendrobatidus, and can act as a reservoir for the disease. It also is a voracious predator in freshwater lakes. Figure 47.13 This Limosa harlequin frog, Atelopus limosus, an endangered species from Panama, died from a fungal disease called Chytridiomycosis. The red lesions are symptomatic of the disease. Credit. Brian Gratwick, early evidence suggests that another fungal pathogen, Geomyces destructans, introduced from Europe is responsible for white nose syndrome, which infects cave hibernating bats in eastern North America and has spread from a point of origin in western New York State, figure 47.14. The disease has decimated bat populations and threatens extinction of species already listed as endangered. The Indiana bat, Myotis sedalis, and potentially the Virginia big-eared bat, Corinorhinus townsendi virginianus. How the fungus was introduced is unclear, but one logical presumption would be that recreational cavers unintentionally brought the fungus on clothes or equipment from Europe. 1390 Chapter 47, Conservation Biology and Biodiversity Access for free at openstacks.org. Figure 47.14 This little brown bat in Greeley Mine, Vermont, March 26, 2009, was found to have white nose syndrome. Credit. Marvin Moriarty, USFWS, Climate Change Climate Change, and specifically the anthropogenic, meaning, caused by humans, warming trend presently escalating, is recognized as a major extinction threat, 
particularly when combined with other threats such as habitat loss and the expansion of disease organisms. Scientists disagree about the likely magnitude of the effects, with extinction rate estimates ranging from 15% to 40% of species destined for extinction by 2050. Scientists do agree, however, that climate change will alter regional climates, including rainfall and snowfall patterns, making habitats less hospitable to the species living in them, in particular, the endemic species. The warming trend will shift colder climates toward the North and South Poles, forcing species to move with their adapted climate norms while facing habitat gaps along the way. The shifting ranges will impose new competitive regimes on species as they find themselves in contact with other species not present in their historic range. One such unexpected species contact is between polar bears and grizzly bears. Previously, these two distinct species had separate ranges. Now, their ranges are overlapping and there are documented cases of these two species mating and producing viable offspring, which may or may not be viable crossing back to either parental species. Changing climates also throw off species delicate timed adaptations to seasonal food resources and breeding times. Many contemporary mismatches to shifts in resource availability and timing have already been documented. 47.3. Threats to biodiversity 1391 Figure 47.15 Since 2008, grizzly bears, Ursus arctos horribilis, have been spotted farther north than their historic range, a possible consequence of climate change. As a result, grizzly bear habitat now overlaps polar bear, Ursus maritimus, habitat. The two species of bears, which are capable of mating and producing viable offspring, are considered separate, ecological, species because historically they lived in different habitats and never met. However, in 2006 a hunter shot a wild grizzly polar bear hybrid known as a growler bear, the first wild hybrid ever found. Range shifts are already being observed. For example, some European bird species ranges have moved 91 kilometers northward. The same study suggested that the optimal shift based on warming trends was double that distance, suggesting that the populations are not moving quickly enough. Range shifts have also been observed in plants, butterflies, other insects, freshwater fishes, reptiles, and mammals. Climate gradients will also move up mountains, eventually crowding species higher in altitude and eliminating the habitat for those species adapted to the highest elevations. Some climates will completely disappear. The accelerating rate of warming in the Arctic significantly reduces snowfall and the formation of sea ice. Without the ice, species like polar bears cannot successfully hunt seals, which are their only reliable source of food. Sea ice coverage has been decreasing since observations began in the mid-20th century, and the rate of decline observed in recent years is far greater than previously predicted. Finally, Global warming will raise ocean levels due to meltwater from glaciers and the greater volume of warmer water. Shorelines will be inundated, reducing island size, which will have an effect on some species, and a number of islands will disappear entirely. Additionally, the gradual melting and subsequent refreezing of the poles, glaciers, and higher elevation mountains, a cycle that has provided freshwater to environments for centuries, will also be jeopardized. This could result in an overabundance of salt water and a shortage of fresh water. 47.4 Preserving biodiversity By the end of this section, you will be able to do the following. Identify new technologies and methods for describing biodiversity. Explain the legislative framework for conservation. Describe principles and challenges of conservation preserved design. Identify examples of the effects of habitat restoration. Discuss the role of zoos in biodiversity conservation Preserving biodiversity is an extraordinary challenge that must be met by greater understanding of biodiversity itself, changes in human behavior and beliefs, and various preservation strategies. Measuring biodiversity The technology of molecular genetics and data processing and storage are maturing to the point where cataloging the planet's species in an accessible way is now feasible. DNA barcoding is one molecular genetic method which takes advantage of rapid evolution in a mitochondrial gene, cytochrome C oxidase 1, present in eukaryotes, except for plants, to identify species using the sequence of portions of the gene. However, plants may be barcoded using a combination of chloroplast genes. Rapid mass sequencing machines make the molecular genetics portion of the work relatively inexpensive and quick. Computer resources store and make available the large volumes of data. 
Projects are currently underway to use DNA barcoding to catalog museum specimens, which have already been named and studied, as well as testing the method on less studied groups. As of mid-2017, close to 200,000 named species had been barcoded. Early studies suggest there are significant numbers of undescribed species that look too much like sibling species to previously be recognized as different. These now can be identified with DNA barcoding. Numerous computer databases now provide information about named species and a framework for adding new species. However, as already noted, at the present rate of description of new species, it will take close to 500 years before the complete catalog of life is known. Many, perhaps most, species on the planet do not have that much time. There is also the problem of understanding which species known to science are threatened and to what degree they are threatened. This task is carried out by the non-profit IUCN which, as previously mentioned, maintains the Red List, an online listing of endangered species categorized by taxonomy, type of threat, and other criteria, figure 47.16. The Red List is supported by scientific research. In 2011, the list contained 61,000 species, all with supporting documentation. Visual Connection Figure 47.16 This chart shows the percentage of various animal species, by group, on the IUCN Red List as of 2007. Which of the following statements is not supported by this graph? 47.4, Preserving Biodiversity 1393A. There are more vulnerable fishes than critically endangered and endangered fishes combined. B. There are more critically endangered amphibians than vulnerable, endangered and critically endangered reptiles combined. C. Within each group, there are more critically endangered species than vulnerable species. D. A greater percentage of bird species are critically endangered than mollusk species. Changing human behavior legislation throughout the world has been enacted to protect species. The legislation includes international treaties as well as national and state laws. The Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora CITES, treaty came into force in 1975. The treaty, and the national legislation that supports it, provides a legal framework for preventing approximately 33,000 listed species from being transported across nations' borders, thus protecting them from being caught or killed when international trade is involved. The treaty is limited in its reach because it only deals with international movement of organisms or their parts. It is also limited by various countries' ability or willingness to enforce the treaty and supporting legislation. The illegal trade in organisms and their parts is probably a market in the hundreds of millions of dollars. Illegal wildlife trade is monitored by another non-profit, trade records analysis of flora and fauna in commerce, traffic. Within many countries there are laws that protect endangered species and regulate hunting and fishing. In the United States, the Endangered Species Act, ESA, was enacted in 1973. Species at risk are listed by the Act. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is required by law to develop plans that protect the listed species and bring them back to sustainable numbers. The Act, and others like it in other countries, is a useful tool, but it suffers because it is often difficult to get a species listed, or to get an effective management plan in place once it is listed. Additionally, species may be controversially taken off the list without necessarily having had a change in their situation. More fundamentally, the approach to protecting individual species rather than entire ecosystems is both inefficient and focuses efforts on a few highly visible and often charismatic species, perhaps at the expense of other species that go unprotected. At the same time, the Act has a critical habitat provision outlined in the recovery mechanism that may benefit species other than the one targeted for management. The Migratory Bird Treaty Act, MBTA, is an agreement between the United States and Canada that was signed into law in 1918 in response to declines in North American bird species caused by hunting. The Act now lists over 800 protected species. It makes it illegal to disturb or kill the protected species or distribute their parts. Much of the hunting of birds in the past was for their feathers. As already mentioned, the private nonprofit sector plays a large role in the conservation effort both in North America and around the world. The approaches range from species-specific organizations to the broadly focused IUCN and TRAFFIC. The Nature Conservancy takes a novel approach. It purchases land and protects it in an attempt to set up preserves for ecosystems. 
Although it is focused largely on reducing carbon and related emissions, the Paris Climate Agreement is a significant step toward altering human behavior in a way that should affect biodiversity. If the agreement is successful in its goal of halting global temperature rise, many species negatively affected by climate change may benefit. Assessments of the Accord's implementation will not take place until 2023, and measurement of its effects will not be feasible for some time. However, the agreement, signed by over 194 countries, represents the world's most concerted and unified effort to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, embrace alternative energy sources, and ease climate pressure on ecosystems. Conservation and Preserves Establishment of Wildlife and Ecosystem Preserves is one of the key tools in conservation efforts. A preserve is an area of land set aside with varying degrees of protection for the organisms that exist within the boundaries of the preserve. Preserves can be effective in the short term for protecting both species and ecosystems, but they face challenges that scientists are still exploring to strengthen their viability as long-term solutions to the preservation of biodiversity and the prevention of extinction. How much area to preserve? Due to the way protected lands are allocated and the way biodiversity is distributed, it is challenging to determine how much land or marine habitat should be protected. The IUCN World Parks Congress estimated that 11.5% of Earth's land surface was covered by preserves of various kinds in 2003. We should note that this area is greater than previous goals. However, it only includes 9 out of 14 recognized major biomes. Similarly, individual animals or types of animals are not equally represented on preserves. For example, High-quality preserves include only about 50% of threatened amphibian species. To guarantee that 1394 Chapter 47, Conservation Biology and Biodiversity Access for free at OpenStax.org. All threatened species will be properly protected, either the protected areas must increase in size, or the percentage of high-quality preserves must increase, or preserves must be targeted with greater attention to biodiversity protection. Researchers indicate that more attention to the latter solution is required. Preserve design There has been extensive research into optimal preserve designs for maintaining biodiversity. The fundamental principle behind much of the research has been the seminal theoretical work of Robert H. MacArthur and Edward O. Wilson published in 1967 on island biogeography. 5. This work sought to understand the factors affecting biodiversity on islands. The fundamental conclusion was that biodiversity on an island was a function of the origin of species through migration, speciation, and extinction on that island. Islands farther from a mainland are harder to get to, so migration is lower and the equilibrium number of species is lower. Within island populations, evidence suggests that the number of species gradually increases to a level similar to the numbers on the mainland from which the species is suspected to have migrated. In addition, smaller islands are harder to find so their immigration rates for new species are typically lower. Smaller islands are also less geographically diverse so all things being equal, there are fewer niches to promote speciation. And finally, smaller islands support smaller populations, so the probability of extinction is higher. As islands get larger, the number of species able to colonize the island and find suitable niches on the island increases, although the effect of island area on species numbers is not a direct correlation. Conservation preserves can be seen as islands of habitat within an ocean of non-habitat. For a species to persist in a preserve, the preserve must be large enough to support it. The critical size depends, in part, on the home range that is characteristic of the species. A preserve for wolves, which range hundreds of kilometers, must be much larger than a preserve for butterflies, which might range within 10 kilometers during its lifetime. But larger preserves have more core area of optimal habitat for individual species, they have more niches to support more species, and they attract more species because they can be found and reached more easily. Preserves perform better when there are buffer zones around them of suboptimal habitat. The buffer allows organisms to exit the boundaries of the preserve without immediate negative consequences from predation or lack of resources. One large preserve is better than the same area of several smaller preserves because there is more core habitat unaffected by edges. For this same reason, preserves in the shape of a square or circle will be better than a preserve with many thin arms. If preserves must be smaller, then providing wildlife corridors between them so that individuals and their genes can move between the preserves, for example along rivers and streams, 
will make the smaller preserves behave more like a large one. All of these factors are taken into consideration when planning the nature of a preserve before the land is set aside. In addition to the physical, biological, and ecological specifications of a preserve, there are a variety of policy, legislative, and enforcement specifications related to uses of the preserve for functions other than protection of species. These can include anything from timber extraction, mineral extraction, regulated hunting, human habitation, and non-destructive human recreation. Many of these policy decisions are made based on political pressures rather than conservation considerations. In some cases, wildlife protection policies have been so strict that subsistence living indigenous populations have been forced from ancestral lands that fell within a preserve. In other cases, even if a preserve is designed to protect wildlife, if the protections are not or cannot be enforced, the preserve status will have little meaning in the face of illegal poaching and timber extraction. This is a widespread problem with preserves in areas of the tropics. Limitations on preserves Some of the limitations on preserves as conservation tools are evident from the discussion of preserve design. Political and economic pressures typically make preserves smaller, rather than larger, so setting aside areas that are large enough is difficult. If the area set aside is sufficiently large, there may not be sufficient area to create a buffer around the preserve. In this case, an area on the outer edges of the preserve inevitably becomes a riskier suboptimal habitat for the species in the preserve. Enforcement of protections is also a significant issue in countries without the resources or political will to prevent poaching and illegal resource extraction. Climate change will create inevitable problems with the location of preserves. The species within them may migrate to higher latitudes as the habitat of the preserve becomes less favorable. Scientists are planning for the effects of global warming on future preserves and striving to predict the need for new preserves to accommodate anticipated changes to habitats. However, the end effectiveness is tenuous since these efforts are prediction-based. 5. Robert H. MacArthur and Edward O. Wilson, E.O. The Theory of Island Biogeography, Princeton, N.J. Princeton University Press, 1967. 47.4. Preserving Biodiversity 1395 Finally, an argument can be made that conservation preserves indicate that humans are growing more separate from nature, and that humans only operate in ways that do damage to biodiversity. Creating preserves may reduce the pressure on humans outside the preserve to be sustainable and non-damaging to biodiversity. On the other hand, properly managed, high-quality preserves present opportunities for humans to witness nature in a less damaging way and preserves may present some financial benefits to local economies. Ultimately, the economic and demographic pressures on biodiversity are unlikely to be mitigated by preserves alone. In order to fully benefit from biodiversity, humans will need to alter activities that damage it. Link to learning an interactive global data system http colon slash slash openstacks.org slash l slash protected underscore areas closing parenthesis of protected areas can be found at this website review data about individual protected areas by location or study statistics on protected areas by country or region habitat restoration habitat restoration holds considerable promise as a mechanism for restoring and maintaining biodiversity of course, once a species has become extinct, its restoration is impossible. However, restoration can improve the biodiversity of degraded ecosystems. Reintroducing wolves, a top predator, to Yellowstone National Park in 1995 led to dramatic changes in the ecosystem that increased biodiversity. The wolves, figure 47.17, function to suppress elk and coyote populations and provide more abundant resources to the guild of carrion eaters. Reducing elk populations has allowed revegetation of riparian areas, which has increased the diversity of species in that habitat. Decreasing the coyote population has increased the populations of species that were previously suppressed by this predator. The number of species of carrion eaters has increased because of the predatory activities of the wolves. In this habitat, the wolf is a keystone species, meaning a species that is instrumental in maintaining diversity in an ecosystem. Removing a keystone species from an ecological community may cause a collapse in diversity. The results from the Yellowstone experiment suggest that restoring a keystone species can have the effect of restoring biodiversity in the community. 
Ecologists have argued for the identification of keystone species where possible and for focusing protection efforts on those species. Likewise, it also makes sense to attempt to return them to their ecosystem if they have been removed. Figure 47.17, uh. The Gibbon Wolf Pack in Yellowstone National Park, March 1, 2007, represents a keystone species. The reintroduction of wolves into Yellowstone National Park in 1995 led to a change in the grazing behavior of B. elk. To avoid predation, the elk no longer grazed exposed stream and riverbeds, such as C. the Lamar Riverbed in Yellowstone. This allowed willow and cottonwood seedlings to grow and recolonize large areas. The seedlings decreased erosion and provided shading to the creek, which improved fish habitat. A new colony of D. beaver may also have benefited from the habitat change. Credit A. Modification of work by Doug Smith, NPS. Credit C. Modification of work by Jim Pico, NPS. Credit D. Modification of work by Shiny Things, Flickr. Other large scale restoration experiments underway involve dam removal, which is a national movement that is accelerating in importance. In the United States, since the mid 1980s, Many aging dams are being considered for removal rather than 1396 Chapter 47, Conservation Biology and Biodiversity Access for free at OpenStax.org. Replacement because of shifting beliefs about the ecological value of free-flowing rivers and because many dams no longer provide the benefit and functions that they did when they were first built. The measured benefits of dam removal include restoration of naturally fluctuating water levels, the purpose of dams is frequently to reduce variation in river flows, which leads to increased fish diversity and improved water quality. In the Pacific Northwest, dam removal projects are expected to increase populations of salmon, which is considered a keystone species because it transports key nutrients to inland ecosystems during its annual spawning migrations. In other regions such as the Atlantic coast, dam removal has allowed the return of spawning anadromous fish species, Species that are born in freshwater, live most of their lives in saltwater, and return to freshwater to spawn. Some of the largest dam removal projects have yet to occur or have happened too recently for the consequences to be measured. The large-scale ecological experiments that these removal projects constitute will provide valuable data for other dam projects slated either for removal or construction. The role of captive breeding zoos have sought to play a role in conservation efforts both through captive breeding programs and education. The transformation of the missions of zoos from collection and exhibition facilities to organizations that are dedicated to conservation is ongoing and gaining strength. In general, it has been recognized that, except in some specific targeted cases, captive breeding programs for endangered species are inefficient and often prone to failure when the species are reintroduced to the wild. However, captive breeding programs have yielded some success stories, such as the American condor reintroduction to the Grand Canyon and the re-establishment of the whooping crane along the Midwest Flyway. Unfortunately, zoo facilities are far too limited to contemplate captive breeding programs for the numbers of species that are now at risk. Education is another potential positive impact of zoos on conservation efforts particularly given the global trend to urbanization and the consequent reduction in contacts between people and wildlife. A number of studies have been performed to look at the effectiveness of zoos on people's attitudes and actions regarding conservation. At present, the results tend to be mixed.